I want to talk to you tonight from this subject, Desperate Times Calls for Desperate Measures. Can you repeat that back? Desperate Times Calls for Desperate Measures. As a prophetess of God, tonight it is my objective to show you how God responds to the desperate. I want to speak to your spirit and your conscience to reignite a fire within, to return back to a place of desperation in him. As we look around in our world and in our churches and in our communities and within our families, it is evident that we are living in desperate days. Each passing day as we wake up, as we look at the newspaper, as we look out at the news, as we look at social media, there is an increasing amount of despair. There is an increasing amount of violence. There is an increasing amount of murder. And not just the murder that we see on a daily basis when it comes to crime. But as we have been sitting here in this church for about two hours now, every 90 seconds that has passed by, there has been murder in the womb by way of abortion. We are living in desperate times. In the book of the tale of two cities, it talks about the fact that we are living in the best of times and the worst of times. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy, Paul calls these times perilous times. In the Greek, this word perilous, it is called kalapas, which means it is hard to do. It is hard to take. It is hard to approach, hard to bear. It is troublesome, dangerous, harsh, fierce, and savage. And the word of the Lord, and let's look at it for just a moment. In 2 Timothy 3, 2 through 6, it says, For men shall be lovers <laughs> of their own selves. Mm -hmm. covetous and boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And the Bible says, from such, turn away. Put a pin mark right there. I'm coming back to verses 6 and 7 in just a moment. Somebody shout, we are living in desperate times. And I am concerned, my brothers and my sisters, that although we are living in desperate times, we are not as desperate for God as we once were. I'm, I'm going to say that again. We are living in desperate times, and it seems like we would run to God in times of desperation. But it seems as if we are backing up from him. I want to just show a few of the plots that the enemy has tried to deceive us with to keep us out of that place of desperation. Can we look at it a little closer tonight? The first thing is casual Christianity. 
I took my glasses off because I'm not really trying to get a lot of crazy stares tonight. I know, I know they're coming in just a few moments. Casual Christianity. Casual Christianity. In Mark, the fifth chapter, verse 24, it shows us that Jesus is going to Jairus' house. He is a ruler in the synagogue. And the Bible says that there are all of these people around him, thronging him, pressing up against him. And out of all of these religious people that possibly came with Jairus to get Jesus' attention, he cannot feel the touch of any of them except for the desperate woman who reaches for him. Wait, 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 wait. I said out of all of the people that are there for possibly the fishes and the loaves who are there just to perhaps get a miracle, he cannot feel the touch of any of them with the exception of this desperate woman. Perhaps it is because of casual Christianity. Mm -hmm. Casual Christianity, what are you talking about? This thing has desensitized us. The Bible says the reason why people and my church cannot get the breakthrough that they so desperately need is because casual Christianity has deadened them to the things of God. Casual Christianity. I need a few of you all to pray for me. I'm going to say, as Bishop says, are you with me tonight? Casual Christianity, it, it has us in chill out mode. Mm -hmm. It has us in just enough mode. It has us in the mindset that it doesn't take all of that. Mm -hmm. It has us in a place of being lukewarm in our relationship with God. Casual Christians, let me identify you tonight. You are the ones or we sometimes are the ones that act like we are doing God a favor when we show up to his house. Or rather, if we show up to his house. Casual Christians are the ones that when the praise and worship team is singing, you have to be warmed up. I'm looking for seven strong witnesses tonight when you hear the truth. I, I did not come for you to shout or dance. If you do, it will be because you hear the truth of God's word. I came to talk to your conscious mind. I came to talk to your spirit. Casual Christianity. We live, casual Christians live on the edge until they fall completely off. Casual Christians. Casual Christianity. It teaches us that self-centeredness and selfishness is the norm. Greed and pride are regarded as virtuous. We have come to the times where many in our nation would prefer to blaspheme God than to attempt to have one right thought about him. Yes, Lord, casual Christianity despises authority. Come on, preachers. Casual Christianity has a large set of entitlement as mentality. It was at one point coming up in the church of God in Christ where sin and immorality shamed us. It made us feel dirty. Come on, somebody talk to me tonight. It, 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 brought, it brought something that we don't use anymore. It brought conviction 
when we hurt God, when we went against the word of God, but casual Christianity uh, now says, listen, it is what it is. Uh, Donny, Donny McClurkin sung that song that he should have never released. We fall down, but we get up. Uh, for a saint was just a sinner, is just a sinner who fell down, but got back up. And that is casual Christianity. Because when a saint falls down, when a saint disobeys, y'all don't want to have no church tonight. When a saint disobeys God, when a, when a saint loses their temper, we don't wallow in it. Uh, we, 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 we're not comfortable there. Casual Christianity tells you to keep sliding in greasy grace. Uh, ah, but the true sons and daughters of God, uh, we repent uh, even if we thought something wrong. Uh, if it didn't come out of our mouth and we thought it, we repent. We don't let time go. We don't let time pass us by because we want to make it right. Come on, talk to me, somebody. We, we want to have an open line of communication. My grandmother used to say, I don't want no trouble on the line. Talk to me, somebody. Casual Christians. Wallow in that sin. And then they have the unmitigated goal to say, don't judge me. Huh? Where we get that from? Don't, 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 don't preach on my sin, preacher. Keep, keep preaching on successful things and keep, keep making me feel good. But, but don't preach on, oh yeah. Don't preach on my sin. Don't preach on holiness. Uh, if you, if you preach on it, then I may leave your church. Uh, ah, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but I feel the Holy Ghost uh, saying, preach it anyway. Across, y'all be seated. We're just talking across social media. Sin goes viral. I said across social media, sin goes viral. While holiness and clean living goes unnoticed. If you're living saved these days, they call you too deep. <laughs> I had somebody that said to me, when you, you, you real saved. I said, I don't understand that. What do you mean real saved? Marchetta, I, what, what are you talking about, you real saved? When, when I talk to you, I got I to gotta get my mind right because you real saved. Well, what's it? I, I thought everybody... Come on, talk to me, somebody. I said, I thought everybody was supposed to be saved. Casual Christianity. It is where our culture and even the church now finds death and destruction entertaining. It is where people hate what is good and love what is evil. Our time is marked by the widespread denial that there is such a thing called absolute truth. Not living our truth. I'm going to mess with some of you women right here. You, you Oprah lovers. I said I need seven people with I'm talking truth even even if I'm talking the truth about you, come on. I, I, the, the Oprah lovers, where Oprah has tried to teach us two things. She tried to teach us that within yourself is a higher power. She tried to teach within yourself that you can think yourself strong and think yourself rich and there is no need to reach for God because the higher power is you, yourself, and I. Somebody shout, the devil is a liar. 
And then she tried to teach us to live our truth. Live your truth. Live your best life. Do what you want to do. Do what feels good. But the last time I looked within myself, I don't have a truth. And even on my best days, my righteousness is still as filthy rags. Ah, the truth about it is that I can't even love God except he draw me to himself. Ah, there is no my truth. He says you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. Somebody shout glory to God. Come on, shout glory to God. We are living in error, men of God. And I'm going to say this, and I know they're filming. This is the good part that we need to be showing on social media and on internet. Stop showing all these praise breaks without showing the preach word of God. Oh God, I lost my amen corner. Come on, show the people what we're praising about. Show them that we just got delivered. And that's why we're shouting. Show them that the preacher just preached on our sin. And that's why we're rejoicing. Glory to God. We, we have people such as Carlton Pearson. Yes, Lord. Carlton Pearson, whom I love as a person. As a matter of fact, he has preached at my dad's church several times. When we were a girl, I remember going down to his pastor's and minister's retreat in Tulsa, Oklahoma. But I want to tell you tonight that Carlton Pearson and the slew of people that are following him, if they don't repent, they are on their way to the hell that he doesn't say exists. Y'all don't want me to talk in here tonight. If they do not repent, they will bust hell wide open. Why? Because um, there is no doctrine of inclusion. Uh, yes, Lord. Um, the only inclusion that we have into the doctrine of Jesus Christ uh, is through the repentance and faith uh, in the precious blood uh, of Jesus Christ. Uh, if you want to be included in the kingdom, uh, you've got to use what works. Uh, and that's the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, somebody throw your hat back uh, and shout the blood still works yes my lord yes my lord yes my lord and so now we have mother we have people who deny the existence of truth and they live for pleasure I'm not boring y'all am I good because I'm just getting started we have people who have these attitudes, not only in society. It would be one thing if it was in society. But now this attitude has infiltrated and it's flourishing in our churches. Mm -hmm. All across the land, religion is now viewed as a private matter. It means that what a person does publicly, their character, their life, and their activities, let's separate religion from that. How the Bible asks us this question. He says, what shall we say then? In Romans 6 and 1, regarding this greasy grace and this sin, shall we continue in sin? That grace may abound. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Throw your head back and shout glory to God. 
the systems, the systems of this world. They have crept into our churches and have begun to di dictate to us the need to be relevant over righteous. Mm -hmm. have, have said to us that in order, superintendent, to appeal to the millennials, Elder John, we have to be relevant now. We have to be hip. In other words, we have to turn our churches into a nightclub. Oh, I, I thought I would get some. Come on. It, it, it's happening now. It's happening. It's happening where, where, where we're, 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 we're turning the lights down low. It's, it's happening. It's happening. It's happening across the body of Christ where we're taking the churches taking the crosses off the churches and replacing it with the fog lights. We're, oh God, y'all y'all sitting tight right here. It's happening now. It's happening where we have the strobe lights because we want to be relevant. But the Bible that I read never told us to be relevant. As a matter of fact, it told us not to conform to this world. I'm going to preach it whether you say amen, whether you buy a book or a CD. It says be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may. You've got to prove this thing. You've got to prove the acceptable and perfect will of God. Somebody shout glory to God. The issue about casual Christianity is that in tough times, we run back to God. When things get better, when we are blessed, we are in there. But we go back and forth. As a matter of fact, some of us, we, you, you, you don't walk completely away from him. You just cool off. Casual, I'm getting ready to get in trouble, Bishop. But I heard you tell me to preach a few moments ago. Casual Christianity has us not only in a place where our spiritual standards are being lowered, but it is also showing up outwardly. Yes, Lord. I'm, I'm coming. I'm coming for the women right quick. It, it is showing up in what we wear. Showing up in what we wear. It's showing up in what we wear. Casual Christianity. It is showing up in what we wear. And what we wear to church. I'm not going to get any help right here. But it seems like in the church, it's the only place where standards don't matter. Come on, women. Let's talk right through here. What, what, what are you putting on when you come to church? Your club clothes don't belong in the church. Your hoochie mama dress don't belong in the church. Your tight skirt don't belong in the church. Your blouse with your cleavage hanging out don't belong in the church. And then, and then you don't want nobody to say nothing to you. You don't want nobody to pull your coattail. Ah, but this church of God in Christ, if I be a woman of God, he's getting ready to put people back in position that will put a card on the door and say homosexual you can't come in the church looking like a woman you can't come in here with your purse and your fingernails y'all don't want me to talk in here there is a standard Hi, there is a standard where are the YPWW meetings where are the meetings? My God, I was in Indiana last weekend preaching.
preaching and the woman of God said to me the pastor's wife superintendent they were going to wear white on that evening and she says uh, she says mother Dijonet she says I I had to have a private meeting with the women because I wanted to make sure they had black slips on oh God upon oh God Y'all looking at me mighty funny like, what? Yeah, you do know they don't even hardly sell slips anymore. I'm, I'm getting ready to get in here real deep. You, you, know, you do know they don't even hardly sell stockings no more. Because they feel like women can just come however they want to. What is it that McDonald's make you have a uniform on? What, what is it that your job has a dress code? Maybe if I smile, y'all will say something to me. What, what is it? What is it that every place mother has a standard? But when it comes to the church, we tell you, come like you are. Hey, you can come one time like that. But when the Holy Ghost get in you, hey God, when the convicting power of God shows you what you should do and what you shouldn't do, you'll go in your closet even if you have to borrow a dress and say, I dare not come to the house of God like that because I don't want to be a hindrance to anybody else. Somebody throw your head back and shout, holiness is still right. I'm losing my I'm losing my amen corner right through here what message are we sending to the world when we dress like them what 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 message preachers are we sending to the world when we put our ripped jeans on to preach behind the sacred y'all don't want me to talk in here i was doing real good until i started talking about this you can't wear your ripped jeans to work when you go before the judge in court you can't wear your ripped jeans y'all don't want me to talk in here but what about the king of kings what about the lord of lords shouldn't we give him our best but casual christianity says it don't take all that but it does and it takes more now in these days where evil is on the rise than it did in the days of old. I'm not lost. I'm still talking about desperate times calls for desperate measures. Would you look at somebody and shake them just in case they have casual Christianity on them and tell them we can't afford to be casual Christians. Oh my God. We, we, we can't afford to be lukewarm. We, we can't afford to be indifferent. He says, God says, I would that you were hot or cold. Ah, because you're lukewarm, you are making me nauseated. Come on, church. Because you're lukewarm, you're making God sick to his stomach. And he says, because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. But I came tonight to prophesy to this church that we're coming back to the things of God. We're coming back to a desperate place with him. We're going to act right and walk right. We're getting ready to talk right and live right. Shake somebody and tell them holiness without no man, no woman shall see the Lord. Say glory. Casual. Casual Christianity. Casual Christianity has robbed us of our desperation. 
Do you remember when you first got saved? <laughs> Come on. I, 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 I want to take your, your mind back to when you first got saved. It, it wasn't nothing you wouldn't give up for God. Hallelujah. It, it wasn't nobody that you wouldn't let go of for God. It, it wasn't any kind of music that you would stop listening to for God because you wanted to please him. But now you got grown and you got a little money in your pocket and you got a car and a nice job and now we're self-sufficient and we are ease in Zion. But shake somebody one more time and tell them you've got to be hot cold somebody shout glory hey, hey, hey. let me let me move through here i feel like i'm getting on some people's nerves but truth of the matter is that's what i that's what i came to do tonight i i, I came to shake us out of our place of complacency and put us in our spirits back over into the things of God. Lift your hands up and say, Lord, take us back. God sent me here to ask his church, to ask the women of God, how is being a casual Christian working out for you? What, what kind of miracles are we seeing by being a casual Christian? How, how, many, how many demons are being cast out as a result of us? being a casual Christian when when people get healed these days it is almost a surprise oh you, oh, you ain't you ain't you ain't seen the wheelchairs being passed around like this is some thing that is a surprise it it should happen on a regular basis for the believer how long church are we to sit idly by and continue to allow the spirit of homosexuality and lesbianism engraft our boys and our girls? There is a cold blue in the spirit. Those two words don't mean much in this place. But if you were in a hospital and they said, cold blue, doctors and nurses would start running to find out who's getting ready to lose their life. <laughs> Whose life can I save? I, I've, I've got to go into action because somebody is hanging in the balance and the Lord sent me here to this jurisdictional women's convention to tell the church and the women two words cold blue somebody's life is in the balance somebody has a gun to their head somebody's contemplating suicide cold They used to sing, throw out the lifeline. Throw out the lifeline. Someone is drifting away. Throw out the lifeline. Someone is sinking today. I need to find out, are there any people in here that you know you have the life of Jesus Christ on the inside of you? I just need 10 women right here to put your hands out in front of you and say, I'm getting ready to throw out the lifeline. I'm getting ready to get back on my post. I'm shaking myself of indifference. I'm shaking myself of gossiping. I'm shaking my 
myself of jealousy. Desperate times calls for desperate measures. Somebody shout glory to God. So this, 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 this woman. Oh, I, I, oh let, me, let, me, let me say this before I move. I, I, gotta, I gotta lift this up because what is our solution for desperate times? What, what is our solution, men of God, for the day and time that we're living in? It is what it has always been, preaching. Y'all didn't say nothing over on this side. What, what, what is our solution? It is preaching. Desperate days calls for determined preaching of God's word. No matter how desperate the days become, the church of Jesus Christ must continually insist that God's word be preached throughout the land. I don't want to hear your success steps. I, you, you're not my motivational coach. <laughs> You're not a motivational speaker. You are a preacher of the word of God. I'm, I'm concerned that now we are telling women to tell your story. And some of y'all were talking a few minutes ago. Now you... I asked somebody, Bishop, I said, when did we exchange it from testimony? Help me, somebody, to story. When did it become about what we went through versus what Jesus went through? To get us out of what we went through. And so now we have women and men who sound more like victims. Come on, get out the, the what do you call that thing? Get out the violin and strike up the band because we have a lot of sad stories. But the Bible says that you overcome him by the blood of the lamb and not by the words of your story, but by the words of your testimony. Preachers, oh God, I'm, 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 I'm in here now. I, I want to give you a church growth strategy preach Jesus no 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 don't spend all of your money going to church growth conferences and seminars and sitting up there trying to figure out how to put people in your seat he says if I be lifted up from the earth I'll draw all men unto me. Somebody shall preach Jesus. So, so, why, why does this woman, why is it so important for her to get to Jesus? It is because Jesus wrapped in flesh came down through 42 generations just to preach the kingdom of God. He, he was, hold, hold on Rocky, he, he, was, he was upsetting the culture. He was engaging the culture. He was disrupting the norm. He, 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 he did not come with, with a new strategy. He did not show up with a marketing technique. 
He, he didn't show up with flyers, passing them out. He had people who wanted to hear what he said. Because he preached, God the Father, himself God the Son. And God, the Holy Spirit, missionaries, preach Jesus. No, no, don't, don't, don't worry about the engagements. Don't worry about the appointments. If you preach Jesus, I'm a living witness that he'll open up doors for you that can't no man close. I'm a living witness that he'll close doors that no man can open. Why don't you grab your sister and tell him, preach Jesus. Most of y'all not saying nothing in here. Cause, Cause now we have prophets and prophetess who are who are prophesying cash, calls, cribs, and, and entering into a new season and, 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 and naming it and claiming it. But, but, but I want to tell you, if we want this church to see revival, I dare somebody to start preaching about heaven and hell again. I said if we want to see revival in the land you need to start preaching heaven and hell somebody shout preaching is the answer for the world today so this woman she presses to Jesus she is not a casual Christian. She is desperate for the things of God. Somebody shout, she is desperate. Shout it one more time, she is desperate. This woman in our text, for 12 years, 144 months, 4,320 days, 100,680 hours, 6,220,800 seconds. She is dealing with an issue of blood. Because of this blood, this woman probably is an anemic. I'm sure she has iron that is gone. She did not have much mental strength. And her physical strength is gone because she needed the blood supply for her stomach to digest food. Her color is flushed. It was a, it was a struggle for her body to be there. And on top of that, because blood is flowing, there is an odor that is possibly following after her. Mm -hmm. She is considered ceremonially unclean. And just the fact that a being in public could cause her to be stoned to death. But she is desperate. She has to make a decision. Am I going back home sick? Or will I become a presser? I, I, I have my last ounce of strength. Am I willing to use this last ounce of strength to get to Jesus? The Bible says that this woman has spent all she had on doctors. She has spent all she had on specialists. She got every prescription fulfilled. She has used all of the potions, all of the concoctions 
that was supposed to make her better. And instead of getting better, the Bible says that she grew worse. But the Bible says that when she heard of Jesus, she came in behind the press. And this is what struck me with this text. It did not say she wanted to touch his shoulder. It didn't say she wanted to get his attention. The Bible says that she touches the hem of his garment. Somebody shout his garment. Why does she say within herself, if I can touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. It is, it is because what Jesus had on as a rabbi, his garment meant something. It, it is what is called the talith or what has been evolved into the prayer shawl. Each tassel represented something. Each thread represented something. It represented the word of God. It represented the authority of God. She wanted to touch him and touch his garment because it said who he was. What he wore represented what he had. What he wore represented what he had. And, and I understand the chains and the crosses and the habits, but I got a question for you. Does it represent what you have? I'm getting ready to get in a lot of trouble. Does it represent what you have? Can, can people look at it and say, if I touch him, if I touch her, I'm going to receive a miracle because what you have on represent what you should have. She touches, and I'm just about done. She touches his garment. One of the things about her posture is that it is a posture of humility. Most women that God heals in the Bible, we see them getting down in their posture of humility. One of the things that we've got to get back to, women of God, we've got to get back to a posture of prayer. I got seven amens and it seemed like the lights start flickering just a little bit right there. We've got to get back down in our posture of prayer. Why? Because we cannot make decisions without talking to the creator that created us. We, we, we can't keep going along without prayer. Somebody shout, we've got to get back to it. She touched his garment. And the Bible says this in scripture, in Luke's gospel. The Bible says for the first time, Bishop, Jesus who had touched everybody, Jesus who had healed the sick, who had worked miracles, for the first time in scripture, he asked, who touched me? I've touched people. <laughs> but who was desperate enough not just to touch me but who was desperate enough to pull virtue, virtue out of me I, I, I need to find just seven women in here tonight and you're saying Lord any way you bless me I'll be satisfied but, but I need to find some women who will touch him until you pull something from him Touch him until you feel 
all power from him. Touch him until you pull something from him that you can take back to your children and take back to your families. Touch him until you get his attention. He says, who touched me? For I perceive that virtue, power, dunamis, just left my body. And the woman trembling because she didn't want to make any qualms. She says, it was me. And she begins to tell him everything. And he says to her, woman, your faith, not your position, your faith has made you whole. In order to touch Jesus, we've got to get in touch with the things that touch him. In order to reach for him, we've got to do the things that get his attention. Is there any fight in this church that will say, I'm going to press through here? I survived the divorce. I survived being lied on. I survived people scandalizing my name. I survived Hurricane Florence. I'm here now. I might as well get his attention. I can't go back home. I'm out of money. I can't go back home. I've lost my friends. But since I'm in close proximity, I need a divine interruption. I said I need a divine interruption. Excuse me, Jairus. I know your daughter is laying there dead, but I have a miracle that I need. And if you know anything about Jesus, he can heal me now and raise your dead daughter from the dead later. Somebody shout, I need a divine interruption. Shout glory. A divine interruption, men of God, is when God makes an executive decision to get to you next. As Mother said, as Crystal said last night, it is when you have been toiling and wrestling, and God says, I see you. I see your faithfulness. I see how you're serving me when everything else is going wrong. But I'm getting ready to make a divine interruption in your life. I'm getting ready to cause your issue to come to a screeching halt. I don't know who I came to preach to tonight, but the Lord sent me to tell you that the cycle you've been going through year after year, tonight he's making you whole. The issue you've been going through year after year, that wayward son, that jacked up daughter, that spirit in your home that's been trying to intimidate you, the cycle breaker, the anointing is here tonight to lift you up out of despair, but you gotta touch him, you gotta touch him, you gotta be desperate, no matter what it takes, I'm willing to give God everything, come on, reach up, reach up, reach up, reach up, desperate times calls for desperate measures you gotta be willing to do something that you ain't done in a long time you gotta be willing to say something that you haven't said in a long time if I gotta get down on my knees I'm willing because I'm desperate throw your head back and shout I'm desperate Who touched me? Who, who, who touched me? Who pulled 
from me. Who, who wanted it bad enough? <laughs> the Lord is, the Lord, the Lord is hovering over this place tonight. And he says there is a set group of people and women in particular. And you don't care nothing about hair, makeup, clothes. You don't care anything about material things. You will say like this woman, I have been dealing with this issue long enough. And I'm not going to get in the presence of God where he is passing out blessings and deliverance and let him get out of my reach. There is one thing, and I'm closing, remain standing. You're getting ready to bring your oil in just a moment. There is one thing the Lord began to speak to me about that has us in this place of casualness with God. It is demonic oppression. It is demonic oppression in the home in particular. I want to tell you something. When you look back at Genesis, the second chapter, yes, Lord. And you see when God made Adam and Eve, and they are together walking around in the garden, just at the end of the second chapter, they're a unit. In the third chapter, exactly after God has presented woman to man, the serpent shows up. He does not show up until the woman is created. He doesn't show up until the woman is created. He is in existence. He has been named. He is crawling on his belly. But he does not show up until the woman is created. And what does he do? He begins to beguile us. Come on, women. He begins to talk to us in an isolated position. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what Eve was doing by herself. I, I, I don't know. Scripture doesn't tell us if she was walking through the garden. If, I, I don't know. But there is a danger. There is a danger, women, in being uncovered. Oh, y'all stop talking to me. There is a danger in being uncovered. Now the serpent is saying to her, Things that are contrary to what God said. Demonic oppression. The Bible shows us in the word of God that there is a war against us and Satan. He says that we, woman, would be enmity against Satan. This is what's happening, and this is what the Lord said to me. In our nation, he is killing off our men quickly. Every day we see the lives of men being taken quickly while he is killing off the women slowly. Why? Because we internalize things. This woman had this issue of blood for 12 years. The woman in the Bible who could in no wise lift up herself had been dealing with it for 18 years. He wants us to die slowly and in silence. But the Bible shows us that although there's enmity between Satan and the woman, 
And although he will bruise our heel, the Bible shows us that we have the authority to bruise his head. The only way that he can bruise our heel is because he is under our feet. And the Lord sent me here tonight as a scud missile. He sent me here in this place to destroy the deadlock of the enemy. Oh, yes. I, I, I didn't come to make negotiations with him. I didn't come to ask him for permission for your freedom. I came here tonight with a vengeance that every woman that is desperate for the things of God, you will be made told you I was coming back. In 2 Timothy 2 and 6. And I'm getting ready to make an altar call and pray. The Bible says that the evil spirits of the last day remain standing, please. Crept into the houses and led captive silly women laden. That word laden, play softly, man of God. It means heavy loaded weighed down with sin, led away with divers lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Tonight the Lord said, I want women to be made whole. But you've got to be willing to be honest with God. Your MAC makeup won't keep covering up where you are. It will not cover where you are tonight. The Lord said, tell them to bring oil. And as you lay hands on this oil, and they take it back to their homes, the spirits that's been trying to oppress the home. I'm not telling you something that I've heard. I'm telling you something that I've experienced. I'm telling you something that I know. I had to say to my own children, if you don't respect the God that I serve, you can't stay here. He wants to wage war in your home. But I want you tonight to come and bring that oil. Bring it and put it on the altar. Bring it quickly. I want you to be the first ones to come. I feel the power of the Holy Ghost. Bring the oil and put it right there in the center of this podium. Come on, lift up a sound man of God. Bring it. Bring it. Bring it. Bring it. 